It's a great pleasure to have a chance to talk to Colin Renfrew, who I've known for many years and sat on many exciting faculty boards with. Um, Colin, tell me, first of all, where and when you were born. I was born in 1937, on the 25th of July, in Stockton-upon-Tees, and that's where my father was at that time working. He was in ICI Plastic, so he was working uh, near there. And I don't have any great recollection of that, because we moved south when I was uh, three or four, down to Wedding Garden City. Uh, so that's where I really grew up, while he was working at ICI Plastics there. Let's go back. Some people like to go back at least to grandparents who have influenced them more, even back to the Tudors and Stuarts. But how far back would you like to go? Is there anything to say about your ancestors? I can't go very far back because um, I never knew either grandfather. They both died before I was born. So I certainly uh, have fond memories of my grandmother, my, uh, my father's uh, mother, uh, who lived in Gifnock near Glasgow. So uh, I went up there for holidays on many occasions and so I've got uh, very happy memories of uh, travelling on the tram because those days that was the way you travelled in Glasgow and trams to a little boy are very impressive uh, enterprises. So I have happy memories of the trams in Glasgow and meeting some relatives there. And then uh, my mother's mother lived uh, in Ardrossan uh, with uh, um, uh, another uh, daughter of, uh, of hers. Uh, and uh, so I had many uh, happy holidays in Ardrossan, which of course has got a very nice seashore. And we sometimes went across to the island of Arran, uh, which is where both my parents had had many holidays. and. Uh, obviously a very beautiful island with good walking and uh, good megalithic monuments, as it uh, <laughs> turned out. Um, and uh, so I have very happy memories of uh, Scotland. I still have uh, quite a number of uh, relatives on my mother's side. That was a large family, although she and all her contemporaries have died now, and I don't really see very much of my, most of my cousins, so I still see one or two of them. Is his name Ren? I mean, Renfrew sounds like Renfrewshire. Is there any connection? It is related, yes. Um, I tried to do a bit of genealogy uh, and uh, uh, went uh, sort of back through the generations for a couple of hundred years. Uh, and uh, the family is from the Paisley area, which of course is in Renfrewshire. So uh, I'm not sure exactly why the term, of course, Renfrew is a, a location, it's a, a city, so they're obvious, but it's not a very common family name, it exists in Scotland and also in Canada and North America because emigration, I believe Renfrew of the Mounties was a very popular <laughs> television program uh, in the uh, 40s and 50s, though I never saw very much of it. Um, so um, that's what the association is, and I've pleasant memories of my two great aunts who live near Paisley uh, and that's about as far as I've been able to trace it. Mm. Tell me something about um, your parents and their, the way they might have influenced you. Um, well, uh, my father was um, a, a very um, energetic person uh, mentally with a wide range of interests and a very nice sense of humour, very gregarious uh, and uh, for instance, he was very interested in languages, which certainly, I think, interested me. When, um, uh, whenever he travelled, he would uh, sort of take a phrase book and try and uh, learn some of the language. So he got to be able to get around in uh, Spanish and Italian uh, and so on. And uh, my mother was also um, enthusiastic for that, so that um, they uh, encouraged me, once we'd been to the continent a couple of times, before I did my national service, um, I thought it would be a good idea to go and learn some more French and went to stay in Paris with a family, which they very warmly supported. And then I did that um, immediately afterwards, because as you know, national service was two years and the timing uh, worked out right. Um, and so I had some very happy sojourns in uh, Paris. And that was really, I think, because of my father's interest and, uh, and my mother's uh, 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 enthusiasm also. Uh, and uh, he was very encouraging, uh, as they both were, of my um, uh, sort of developing interests. During the war years, 
um, when there was no petrol to travel by car or anything, uh, we used to go off, uh, uh, my father and I, for a, a trip on uh, a bicycle, uh, visiting parish churches. And we both liked the atmosphere. We weren't particularly... This was in Hertfordshire. Hertfordshire, yes, yeah. around from uh, out of Welling Garden City. Sort of 10 or 15 miles, a lot of parish churches within that radius. Uh, and that was, I have really very happy memories of doing that, and I think he did that actively to spend some time with me, which I valued. And I think um, uh, probably something of the, um, the atmosphere uh, of churches and these nice bits of architecture and so on uh, probably stayed with me from that time. He also used to take me... Uh, Occasionally, when we were in London, uh, he would sort of drag me into the National Gallery, but I was quite a small boy then, uh, and uh, uh, would begin to get impatient. Uh, but maybe that experience made it seem natural to go into the National Gallery myself when I felt a bit more uh, inclined to look seriously at the pictures. He didn't take you to the British Museum and look at um, objects? I think, oh yes, I, I, I don't think um, with any great... Um, intention of looking at particular objects, but he was a person of great curiosity and certainly I visited the British Museum several times as, um, as a, quite a small boy and remember, not surprising, looking at the mummies and so on, which uh, would be the first um, a point of attention, I suppose, for a small boy. So um, uh, I'm sure those things uh, helped to set up interests which uh, developed later. Did you have any particular, we're talking sort of in your five, six, seven years old. Do you have any particular hobbies or interests by that time? Yes, I started at um, uh, quite early on, I wouldn't know what age, but five or six or something, collecting coins. Uh, and uh, I first of all was collecting coins from change, because in those days, as you'll remember, you've got Victorian mm. coins, you've got button pennies, a young head of... Uh, uh, Queen Victoria as well as the old head and all kinds of things in change. Uh, and then um, I suppose I was uh, soon uh, collecting a few Roman coins and it must have, I think, have been my father's encouragement um, that he took me, uh, he must have looked up who was the leading coin dealer in London uh, and that was Baldwin's uh, and so <coughs> uh, they were very welcome. I must have been just seven or eight and showed me some coins and uh, uh, my father bought me one or two, and um, I started to collect coins quite seriously then, in a schoolboyish way, um, and of course a wide range of foreign coins, and then I really became quite um, an intensive uh, collector, and um, uh, after we'd visited um, Etruria on our first trip uh, overseas, which was when I was 12, <coughs> then it seemed natural to start trying to collect uh, Etruscan coins, and I subscribed to the coin bulletin. Seabees had a coin bulletin, and Sphinx had a numismatic circular, being slightly higher up market. Uh, and um, uh, so I would sort of choose uh, things that looked interesting, and if I got a birthday or a Christmas present coming, would suggest this or that might be uh, appropriate. Uh, and so over the years, I built up. Um, quite a good collection of Etruscan coins, and then I got interested also in uh, coins of the Civil War, the English Civil War, which are really very rare, uh, but um, Newark uh, sixpences uh, and so on, or shillings, uh, were available, and those became very special presents, uh, and uh, so I do have some interesting uh, coins, although um, I... Uh, really stopped. I, I never was a serious numismatist in the sense of being in a scholarly way. Uh, I've got a friend, uh, Ian Stewart, now Lord Stewart B, who, when he was a schoolboy, was writing books on the <laughs> Scottish coinage and a, a real scholar. Well, I was never a scholar uh, in that direction at all. Uh, but uh, I really couldn't afford to buy good coins were getting more and more expensive once I was uh, into my twenties. Um, and then, uh, more recently, um, I've become more puristic uh, about the matter uh, because um, more recently uh, I realised how uh, collecting antiquities um, really does serious damage to the archaeological record. And though I don't think <coughs> collecting coins is um, as serious as collecting 
artefacts that have very clearly been looted from the ground, I've now made such um, sort of puristic statements uh, that it would now be inappropriate for me the to buy any more. The police raided your house and found <laughs> <laughs> your collection. <laughs> well, I've also got one or two antiquities that I bought. Uh, I bought um, a very beautiful Ushabti figure, one of the Egyptian uh, figures that were buried with the dead. I think when I was <coughs> excavating in Canterbury, the age of about 16, I used to go around the antique shops and saw this beautiful Ushabti figure and bought it for about 10 shillings. So that is still uh, on a mantelpiece at home. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Remember, this is going out to the world. <laughs> oh, this was well before I was, six, if I was 16. This would be in 1953, <laughs> well before the 1970 UNESCO Convention was uh, mm. published. So I think uh, I can confess this small thing to the world. <laughs> But you, so you still continue your coin collecting, and or it's more or less stopped. No, I don't. I don't collect coins uh, anymore. Um, uh, there's a whole story about um, uh, the problems that numismatists have to mm. stay within what is uh, ethical, uh, and I have a lot of sympathy with some of the things they say. But having been so uh, dogmatic uh, to the point of sanctimony, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, on the uh, the ills of collecting. I think there is still a place for collecting, uh, but I think it's simplest if I don't collect antiquities. And more recently, I've come to regard coins as broadly lying in that field. So I don't. I still have my collection. In fact, it's time I sold it, and I don't know how I do that elegantly without uh, uh, attracting disapprobation, but that's another problem. <laughs> okay, well... Um you, the only thing left with the, with the early part is really your mother's character. Um, I mean, was she a, a reader? Was she? Did she have a job? Or? No, she she simply uh, uh, ran the house. Uh, that was just you and her uh, siblings. Or? Uh, the, unfortunately, no, I didn't have any siblings. Um, I believe I uh, had, or my mother had um, uh, a daughter who died at birth or something a couple of years before I was born. Hmm. So I in practice never had any siblings. She was a delightful person and very interested, uh, uh, but not in the same energetic way as my father, who um, uh, was a, a great reader. My mother read a little, but not so much. But she had her own interests. Um, uh, we had very good friends uh, in Welling Garden City, family friends, um, Ted and Rini Power, uh, and uh, they were contemporaries of my parents, and he formed a wonderful collection of uh, contemporary art. Uh, he, a self-made man, he'd made his uh, money in Murphy Radio, which was a great enterprise at the time. And when he sold up, he was, as I say, a wealthy man. Uh, and he was way ahead of his time in uh, collecting contemporary art. So he had works by Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko and so on, in his house um, in Welling Garden City uh, in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, which I got to know. And his wife, Rini, and my mother were great friends, so they would go to London sometimes and visit galleries and so on. So my mother did have many interests, but perhaps not quite in the same vigorous way as my father. What was the first school that you went to? The first school I went to was in Welling Garden City, Sherrod's Wood School, which was very close uh, to us, within easy walking uh, distance. Um, and it was um, a well-run school. Um, it had, uh, or tried to have, slightly modern ideas about uh, education, though I couldn't really set out their philosophy, <laughs> but they clearly did have such uh, ideas. But uh, I think, um, as can happen, uh, the academic standards um, were not terrifically high. So although I was happy there, it was my mother, I think, who said to my father that I ought to be going to somewhere a bit more demanding. Uh, and so uh, they suggested that to me, and I didn't particularly disagree. Uh, and so they put me down uh, for the common entrance, or whatever you call it, for St Albans School, uh, which St Albans is seven or eight miles away from Welling Garden City, so it was a bus ride. Um, and uh, I got uh, a scholarship there. In those days, they weren't means tested. I don't think I mean, my father was reasonably well off, well paid at, uh, at ICI. But anyway, I got my bus pass and my scholarship. 
and went to St Albans School, uh, which certainly I think was much more academically oriented, maybe in that sense less modern than Sherrill's Wood, uh, but had a terrific group of uh, schoolmasters, many of whom I still remember with great uh, fondness, and a very good uh, group of people in the same class, uh, one or two of whom I still uh, keep up with. Um, and uh, so that was really good. They really sparked interest. The English master was very enthusiastic about poetry in a way that was uh, uh, wasn't him spouting. What was his name? McClellan. McClellan. Uh, and uh, he, he was, uh, uh, just got us all reading and taking part in you know, readings from Shakespeare and so on, uh, but in a way that he wasn't telling us we were in the end doing a great deal of the work. And one had to sit for English O-level then, uh, one had to do some set books. So it was a wonderful way of getting to know Shakespeare well, to do uh, a Shakespeare play in real, real detail, this was Twelfth Night. Uh, and so I think it's a marvellous uh, benefit to be able to go to any play by Shakespeare and not find it complicated because one has heard a little of the language, and Chaucer also, and then had a very uh, encouraging Latin master. I never found the Latin very interesting, but he was a very nice man who arranged for me to go on my first excavation. And then the... Uh, what, was his, what was his He was Coles. Uh, Coles. Yes. Hmm. And then uh, Mr. Tanner, Bob Tanner, the art master, hmm. uh, was sympathetic that I didn't seem to have much... Uh, competence at drawing or, or painting, but was very interested in the books that he had in his collection. So um, I got to know, uh, you know some of the Renaissance uh, masters um, a little bit from these books uh, quite early on, which that was when I began to take an interest in art and when I began to enjoy visits to the um, to the National Gallery or whatever. And then the physics master, Geoffrey Pryke, was also a great um, amateur acting person, and so he arranged uh, uh, dramatic performances, not so much in school, others did that, but out of school, and I uh, took, play, took part in some of those. And so there were just lots of um, extracurricular activity. I was never a very good sports person, never enjoyed uh, cricket or uh, uh, rugby or, or whatever, but there were lots of other things happening at the school that um, uh, did involve one, and. Uh, also, St. Albans School um, occupies the Abbey Gateway of St. Albans Cathedral uh, and the services, uh, we had hall every day, but twice a week there was a service in St. Albans Cathedral and uh, I got in the school choir, as many people did, and uh, came to enjoy that very much, uh, carol services in the cathedral and so on, uh, really were a good experience. M moving on along music, I mean, has music meant a lot to you through your life, and what kind of music? I do enjoy music. Um, I've never, I did learn piano a little, but never really got through a barrier as mm -hmm. to enjoying playing uh, very much. So I never played effectively. I've enjoyed singing uh, and um, uh, have d did sing in Jesus College with the uh, choir there sometimes. And I very much remember my, early, my, my first participation in something serious was while I was still at Sherrod's Wood School, therefore I was about age 10, uh, which was um, St. John's Passion, which, uh, by Bach, which um, uh, was... Uh, was very was ambitious for a 10-year-old. Uh, well, I was, only in the <laughs> I was only taking part with the other trebles in the treble line, so mm. I don't think that was particularly ambitious. And um, uh, I did come to uh, enjoy listening to music. And Geoffrey Pike again used to take school visits to all kinds of orchestral uh, productions in London and elsewhere. So uh, I do enjoy uh, classical music, but I've never been a great exponent. Uh, and um, uh, I've got to be more interested in the theatre than in, in uh, going to a concert. Uh, and so while I had the chance um, Later, I was very often going to see what was on at uh, the theatre in London. Mm. What about listening? Some people find that their work uh, is done better, well, writing or whatever it is, accompanied by music, or they are inspired by music. To I, I don't, I don't uh, do that. I just um, blaze away while I'm uh, <laughs> working. And uh, I know some people, I've, I've got friends, painters, who love to listen while they're painting and so mm. on. 
Uh, but um, I'm, and so I've not really listened to huge. I mean, I've listened occasionally, but I'm uh, music doesn't play a central role in my life, even though I think um, I, I do find it very moving and enjoy it very much. But sometimes uh, uh, I think it's more exciting to go and see a play where the drama is unfolding before you, as it were. I, later on we'll come to politics probably, but were, were there any signs of your interest in politics present at St Albans? I mean, did you...? Um, not to any very great point. Um, uh, we were all, um, a lot of us were argumentative um, and liked talking and I suppose liked hearing our own voices and uh, certainly there was a debating society which um, uh, I enjoyed uh, taking part in and was probably uh, good training. Uh, but I didn't get more seriously involved in politics till I got up to university really. And that also there related with uh, debating um, uh, also. Mm. And St Albans, the only other old boy I can recall just at the moment is my former beloved Professor Jack Goody. I mean, it, to produce two such eminent um, Arcanance people seems uh, to suggest it was a very good school. Um, and there it, presumably it was others. and I think is a good school. Um, Jack, of course, was a little um, uh, beyond me, mm. so I, I didn't know Jack at all um, mm. at St Albans. And another, and perhaps more celebrated uh, Albanian, um, younger than me and therefore younger than Jack, is Stephen Hawking. Ah. Uh, but an exact contemporary of mine, whom you might uh, uh, know, um, is Joe Can, who mm. was a fellow of uh, St John's mm. uh, for a while, uh, and then went on to be professor elsewhere, who is a, a geologist, a very distinguished geologist. Mm. Uh, and so we were in the same class uh, at school, indeed also in the same class for a while before he moved elsewhere was uh, uh, Ansel Dunham, mm. uh, who was another uh, geologist. Mm. Uh, who was, he died rather young, unfortunately, but was a distinguished geologist. Mm. So some very interesting distinguished people. The other thing that often happens towards the end of one's teenage years is that one either takes to or against religion, organised religion, presumably you were singing in the choir in St Albans Abbey and so on. You were an Anglican um, at that time. Yes, I was baptised into the Church of England. Um, never confirmed. Um, I never sort of felt an urge to be confirmed. And nobody particularly encouraged me to be confirmed. There was no great pressure in the school. There, there were certainly possibilities. Um, and uh, neither of my parents, I think, was uh, very uh, sort of uh, actively inclined towards the divinity. I certainly was um, uh, interested. I remember from being the age of uh, uh, eight or nine having um, a sort of asking questions, which ultimately were philosophical questions. I had an uncle whom I liked very well, my uncle George, uh, who was a Catholic and uh, quite clear about being a Catholic, and I used to ask him questions about things I didn't understand, and was never very satisfied by the answers. Uh, and um, so uh, I think I've always had a, a sceptical streak about anything, uh, really, um, and I think my scepticism developed and developed while I was at school, uh, and uh, so I've never found it possible to be a profound believer uh, in uh, the Trinity or in the Christian, whether Anglican or Catholic, uh, concept of uh, God and uh, Christ and so on. Uh, it's a fascinating um, story and um, I certainly find many beautiful things in a church service on some occasions. So. Uh, I haven't got uh, provoked into the position of some as to uh, sort of uh, uh, excoriate all religious thinking and activity, uh, but the central concept that this explains things, because I think my approach has always been to try and understand uh, how things work. Uh, I went up to university to do natural sciences originally and was interested in um, a lot of those interesting questions which the sciences can uh, uh, help you think about 
and um, uh, I really never found that the concept of the divinity uh, helped to answer any of those questions. And did you ever find as master of a college which had previously been a Benedictine nunnery or whatever uh, Jesus was that being presiding over religious um, rituals of, to a certain extent, not presiding, but certainly being caused any dissonance or worry? I didn't. Um, it may be uh, that if I'd um, uh, undertaken a more rigorous uh, analysis, uh, one might have found some uh, inconsistencies. Indeed, I think when you read that there is uh, an inconsistency in pronouncing the words of the Apostles' uh, Creed, um, when I can't really say that um, I utter those words with a full and devout heart, uh, as it were. Um, but uh, it's conventionally, in a college like Jesus College, as you very well know, um, uh, the role of the Master to be present uh, at, uh, particularly on Sunday services, um, and uh, perhaps to take the preacher in to dinner in hall afterwards. Uh, I know there are a lot of different devices. I remember uh, in St. John's, I think uh, uh, Harry Hinsley, as I recall, wouldn't go into the service, but would always uh, devoutly take the preacher in to dinner and uh, manage to uh, reach an adjustment, I presume, uh, in that way. Um, so, uh, but one thing, of course, in Jesus, as indeed in St. John's, is that uh, the choral music is very good. There's a great choral tradition in Jesus College uh, and uh, I would sometimes go in quite apart from the obligation which it is obviously if one had a strong moral objection one could say I'm not going to do this and mm. the world wouldn't come to an end but uh, I would quite often go in during the week uh, just to hear the sung even song which of course is a much shorter service and uh, uh, avoids uh, being obliged to listen to a sermon of variable quality. Uh, and uh, I used to enjoy it. And indeed, I haven't, because I've been very busy, I haven't been doing that recently now that I no longer live in college. But I can certainly imagine myself popping in from time to time to enjoy a choral uh, even song. So I was never hostile to um, the, uh, the work of the chapel, uh, partly because I very much respected the people involved, the chaplains, and they undoubtedly do good works there. Um, but I've never really done a great census of whether the church has been a good thing or a bad thing in the history of the world. <laughs> I really haven't pronounced on that and uh, probably better not doing so. <laughs> um, okay, well let, let's um, now go on to University, although you mentioned that you went on to do natural sciences, had you been good at sciences at yes. Alban? Yes, um, uh, and I partly because I found these general questions range what were the origins of the world, the origin of the universe, uh, what was the nature of life, and so on. These questions, which uh, are obviously fascinating to questions for us all, they were very much questions where advances were being made uh, in the 50s. Um, as well as subsequently, and uh, so um, I, th there used to be a very nice, uh, I think, Penguin or Pelican publication, science sort of annually, sort of mm. science roundup, where uh, some of these uh, issues in scientific progress were addressed. And uh, I must say, I found uh, some of the teaching in the humanities a little woolly. I didn't really see what was the point in learning more about the history of the Tudors. Uh, I didn't really find that very uh, engaging, uh, whereas um, to be being introduced to and understanding the laws of physics through experiment, I had a very good um, uh, teacher, Mr. Marshall, uh, who was very rigorous. He would write his uh, uh, his explanations on the note on the on the board, but if there was something you didn't understand, it said, "Can that be right?" or "Excuse me, could you explain that?" He felt it his obligation uh, to make that clear, and if there was something that wasn't quite clear in his mind, he would go away and clarify it. And I very much like the clarity and the rigour of physics, uh, and to some extent, a lesser extent, the, uh, the other uh, sciences. So, uh, yes, I was 
quite good at uh, that, although I think I was good enough at the arts subjects also. Um, the headmaster, Mr. Marsh, had encouraged me warmly to uh, do the humanities and sort of advised my parents that he thought I would be well suited. He was himself a classicist, so he had his own uh, penchant. Um, uh, and indeed, he wrote on my uh, school uh, report, I think, the year the sixth form began and you made the definitive choice to the sign. He wrote Qualis Artifex Perdio, uh, which you know were uh, uh, Nero's last words. <laughs> Really? I think, uh, yeah, but uh, what, what an artist dies with me was, uh, <laughs> uh, I believe, Nero's last words. Um, so he, I remember his putting that on the, uh, uh, the, the report form. But anyway, uh, it was um, a wonderful course in Cambridge because, um, uh, as you know, the natural sciences tripos uh, requires you to do quite a mix of subjects. So I did... Uh, um, mathematics and an additional half subject of mathematics and physics and chemistry and a half subject biochemistry and um, a half subject uh, history and philosophy of science which was a natural package to make up the total modules we would call them uh, these days uh, which as you know was a two-year course and I enjoyed that very much um, but uh, I wasn't really uh, a terrifically good mathematician. I don't think I knew that till I got to Cambridge. And I wasn't a particularly bad mathematician, but it came more and more clear that if one was really going to see one's way through uh, physics at a higher level, uh, one would be much better off being uh, uh, a really first-class mathematician, which I wasn't. Uh, and I was getting more and more interested in uh, archaeology. I mentioned that I'd been on excavations as a schoolboy um, from quite an early age, from about the age of 14 or 15. Um, uh, Mr. Coles, whom I mentioned to you, had organised. Um, he uh, knew uh, uh, a lady at the Verilamia Museum who knew Shepherd Freer, or assisted Shepherd Freer, uh, who was excavating at Canterbury. And, and he was a schoolmaster at uh, that time, but a very fine excavator. So he agreed that I would be able to go and dig with him during the vacation for a couple of weeks uh, at Easter and in the summer. And I did that for several seasons and just found that very fascinating to see the information emerging as you dig and be bringing it to light, uh, literally. I found that great fun and so I enjoyed excavating very much. And read a little. I remember uh, I subscribed to Antiquity at quite near. I'm not sure that I read all that was in the, uh, the journal, but I took an interest and so on. Um, and uh, then I, on a number of holidays, seen some fascinating places. And just gradually it began to dawn on me during, the, I suppose, the second of those two years in Cambridge, uh, when I had to ask myself, what would I do after one more year when I went out into the world? Um, I certainly wasn't going to do uh, research on one particular organic compound and define all its propensities and properties, and that was going to be my contribution. Also, I think perhaps I saw some of the disadvantages of um, my father's uh, uh, lifestyle um, in the sense that he was um, a, a successful director of ICI Plastics. He was a sales director, so he was traveling around the world and enjoying it thoroughly, but he always just had a couple of hours to himself in this place or that place. So he saw some wonderful things, but in a very brief and therefore slightly superficial way. Uh, and uh, I didn't really um, see myself as becoming or seeking to become uh, a captain of industry, uh, and so I thought in the end mm, archaeology might be something interesting to take more seriously. And uh, as you know, in Cambridge uh, it's amazingly easy to change subjects. You take part one of the tripos of the examination system, uh, and then you can, if you, wi if you wish, change to another. I, I was lucky because uh, I was um, in St. John's College, and uh, in my first year I was on the same staircase as Glyn Daniel, who was a charming man as well as a very distinguished archaeologist, and already knew him uh, casually, not well, but rather casually, 
And so when my tutor uh, said, well, you ought to go and discuss this with Dr. Daniel, that was uh, an easy thing to do. And he said, oh, the easiest thing in the world. And uh, so I changed to archaeology and uh, found that absorbing and uh, uh, without um, posing quite the same problems as to what one would do afterwards. It was it a two-year part two that you did there? Yes. Um, as you imply, normally one would finish after th three years, mm -hmm. but the suggestion was uh, that, uh, because I had done natural science for two mm -hmm. years, and we only needed to do one more year before the finals, and indeed, actually, the part one examination in natural sciences was sufficient qualification for the degree, so um, I did two years. I was, it was suggested I should do two years uh, archaeology, which was a two-year part two, but after one year, technically, I was qualified for the BA because mm. I'd taken part one natural sciences and uh, had the three-year qualification. Mm. But anyway, it was a two-year uh, course that I took mm. part in, and uh, very good fun it was. Tell me, tell me about the teachers. I've had pen portraits of uh, Cambridge anthropologists of that era, but not of the archaeologists. So Glyn was there. Um... Glyn Daniel, the, the professor was Graham Clark, mm -hmm. uh, and Glyn Daniel was one of the uh, teachers. Charles McBurney was another, though I didn't see much of him because I wasn't doing the Paleolithic mm -hmm. option, which was his uh, thing. And John Coles uh, was the lecturer. Uh, and there are one or two more. Eric Higgs was in uh, the background doing supervisions, but mm -hmm. he wasn't a lecturer. Uh, but John Coles, I think, was the person who did the brunt of the work in covering um, the, uh, the Bronze Age. Um, uh, there were options, of course. I chose the N, B, and I, the Neolithic Bronze and Iron. Um, and uh, uh, John Coles certainly laid much of the groundwork of the course. Uh, and Glynn did most of the uh, Neolithic, uh, which he did very well, always stressing his own interests. We learnt a lot about the megaliths, <laughs> uh, which he put across with great charm. And Glynn, of course, was always uh, up to date with news of the moment, because Glynn was the editor of Antiquity at that time. Mm. So uh, some new article would have caught his attention, or some new radiocarbon date, and he'd come in and announce the new radiocarbon dates to us. So he was all very much up to the moment. Uh, but um, I think all the students at that time uh, owed a great uh, debt of gratitude to John Coles, who was, of course, younger than, uh, than Graham Clark or Glenn Daniel, and I think a little bit more in touch with what the students really needed uh, to pass their examinations and so on. And so he did a lot of the, the bread and butter teaching in a very systematic uh, way. Was he at St John's as well? No, no. I think he may have been St Catherine's College, but he certainly wasn't hmm. at St John's. I was I never quite, I mean, I envied, but was saddened when he took very pretty early retirement, didn't he? Um, yes, he did. Then he, he went down to... Um, Somerset. And that's right, and, and then has had a very uh, uh, active yeah. academic career since then, also mm. at Exeter, uh, I think. But it was, it was, yes, it was sad that he left uh, Cambridge uh, um, quite uh, early on. I don't quite know why that was. Mm. Uh, but anyway, I think we owed him a great de a debt of gratitude. But Glynn um, uh, always made uh, everything interesting, hmm. partly by talking about the things that interested him, rather more than the curriculum sometimes. Hmm. And supervisions with him were always delightful. And uh, Glynn, of course, was really interested in people, so that uh, the personalities of archaeology fascinated him uh, and uh, became very entertaining for everybody. Uh, and um, uh, he, of course, knew everybody in the archaeological world, uh, doubly so through uh, his work as editor of Antiquity, and uh, so he'd uh, have a little party in his rooms from time to time, a little drinks party on a Sunday morning, and so that's when I first met uh, Sir Mortimer Wheeler and uh, quite a lot of interesting people. And was that, do you think, a contribution to your interest in the history of archaeology. I mean, Glenn wrote about the history of archaeology. Yes. Um, I think the history of archaeology, for me, is an interesting subject uh, because of the growth of ideas. And uh, archaeology, uh, as you know as well as I do, is a slightly curious subject uh, because it isn't clear uh, 
what you should be studying, or uh, it wasn't clear two centuries ago or three centuries how you'd find out about it. It's a subject that's had to construct its own theoretical framework just over the past century and a half, really, or two centuries. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Glynn's book, The Idea of Prehistory, is one of the best books in archaeology that's ever been written. It's true that he did a longer history of archaeology, 100 years of archaeology, yes. which was full of informative detail. Uh, but actually, as an ideas book, the idea of prehistory, I think, is terrific. Mm. And there are lots of things about uh, prehistory uh, that are not obvious, and I'm sure lots of developments yet to come uh, mm. that are not uh, obvious. It's, I suppose it's true of most of it, but it's a subject that its practitioners have had to invent and it's been quite uh, a difficult course doing so uh, over those uh, 150 years, I think. Um, and so uh, I think Glynn's thoughtfulness about that, uh, I say thoughtfulness, and he really was uh, thoughtful, say, about the three-age system, mm -hmm. although um, it always disappointed me and puzzled me a little uh, that he wasn't thoughtful, I don't think, in quite the same way uh, about our own time. Uh, he uh, uh, sort of opined early on that the so-called new archaeology was uh, just a lot of verbiage from beginning to end mm. and never had any time for it at all mm. um, and wasn't really interested in the problems or wasn't as ex expounded by uh, so-called new archaeologists of the, the nature of explanation in archaeology, uh, which was curious because his book, The Idea of Prehistory, um, is full of early examinations of what is the nature of explanation in archaeology. But I still think it's one of the best introductions to archaeology ever written. It's ironical, in a way, then, that he appointed, or must have been in, central to the appointment of one of the great new archaeologists, David Clark. I don't think Glynn was particularly central to uh, that, uh, because... <laughs> they they uh, overlapped, I mean... They, they overlapped, certainly, uh, but... Uh, and I'm sure Glynn was uh, encouraging uh, to David Clark uh, early on, uh, but uh, David Clark um, was very much uh, a protégé of Graham Clark uh, in the early years, uh, and uh, Graham and Glynn never got on very well, uh, and uh, in their later years uh, didn't get on at all. Um, Glynn used to tell uh, the tale, and indeed many of uh, uh, Glynn's uh, uh, tales are very clearly set down in his wonderful uh, autobiography, mm -hmm. Some Small Harvest, uh, and uh, uh, one of Graham Clark's most interesting books uh, was World Prehistory, mm -hmm. uh, which I think was um, uh, in many ways a wonderful book. Uh, but Glynn uh, narrated that uh, he and Graham Clark and uh, Stuart Piggott had been approached, would they write together uh, a volume uh, on the basically world prehistory? And they'd had some discussion about this, and then the discussion had uh, dropped away. And then suddenly Graham Clark produced the book, uh, <laughs> which I think uh, Glynn thought uh, wasn't entirely uh, appropriate. Uh, but they had very different styles. Um, I don't, I've never really understood why they uh, didn't get on. Um, uh, Graham Clark's work was very tightly focused and he probably uh, had, I think, no very great admiration for Glynn as a scholar. Uh, Glynn, with his very broad range of interests, probably thought of Graham Clark as being too narrowly focused. So though I think they were both uh, terrific figures, um, they didn't get on. And uh, people who knew the Danish scene uh, used to compare them uh, with uh, Becker and Clint Jensen uh, in Copenhagen. Clint Jensen being a bon viveur uh, like Glynn and always willing to have a good and rather gossipy uh, conversation uh, and Becker being much more strictly focused on what he was focused upon. So that was one of the realities of the department in those days. And then um, 
uh, Charles McBurney, whom I imagine you would have known. Uh, I, I acted as secretary of the faculty board with Charles as chair. You can ah, well then you'll have many a tale to tell. Uh, uh, and uh, I didn't know Charles. Well, I got to know him later and liked him very well. He was, of course, a man of great uh, enthusiasm, um, devoted, I think, exclusively to the Paleolithic period, uh, which Graham Clark would see the point of, but Glyn less so. Uh, but um, I don't know why, but uh, uh, McBurney and uh, Glyn Daniel didn't get on terribly well together. And indeed, I'm not sure that McBurney and Clark were, the, were huge buddies. I mean, I think they got on constructively enough. But then into the picture came uh, Eric Higgs, who was um, uh, very much a protege of, uh, of, Graham, uh, of Graham Clark. Um, and uh, uh, Eric Higgs rather followed and developed the, uh, the Clark line on the importance of environmental data. And uh, uh, Eric Higgs became completely focused uh, on the subsistence base and sort of developed the view this was really all that mattered in archaeology. So there were really lots of uh, differing um, views in the department, which I think I'd never quite known because I was only a student at the time, but I think really uh, led to people really not talking to each other very much and being on not very good terms. Whereas um, in more recent times, when, uh, when I came back to um, Cambridge as the Disney professor, uh, Ian Hodder was already there, and we had lots of uh, disagreements of a conceptual nature, because he was very much propagating what he considered to be post-processual archaeology, uh, and uh, I've always been happy to accept the label of being a, a processual archaeologist, and so I've never totally accepted the claims of the post-processual archaeologist to replace all former thinking, uh, and of course uh, differed in some of the, uh, um, the content. They were uh, essentially taking a rather anti in the early days, I know, a rather anti-scientific view, and though uh, they were no doubt justified in some of the rather excessive scientism of uh, the archaeology of the, uh, the late 60s, uh, early 70s, the so-called new archaeology or processual archaeology. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the disparity, the dichotomy, the polarity was um, really, uh, I think, quite unnecessary. And I found some of their claims not so much Ian's, but some of his uh, coterie, as you could call it, uh, a little pretentious mm. and certainly not entirely acceptable. But I mention all of that uh, precisely uh, because I've always got on very well with uh, uh, Ian, never had any difficulty in talking with him about uh, anything, and we remain good friends, and I think some of that polarity is slightly uh, diminished. So it's not as if we belong in different worlds. But the point is, even when we did have rather different views, um, it didn't lead to any uh, fractious feelings, whereas I have the sense that there really were uh, chills and froideurs uh, and dissensions in the Department of Archaeology uh, in the very late 50s, very early 60s, while I was an undergraduate student. Mm. I mean, we're, we may come back to him, but I mentioned David Clark earlier. Yes. Um, I remember being on a train and someone uh, talking to someone and this, when I, I revealed that I was in the archaeology and anthropology faculty, they said, oh, tell me about David Clark. He's one of the greatest archaeologists in the world. And I said, I've never met him, never heard of him. Ah. <laughs> well, I'd heard of him, but I, mean, I, I knew him just for the last year or two. He was a very exciting person, and I think in, in some ways he was one of the greatest uh, archaeologists in the world. Um, uh, because I had done national service, we were roughly the same age, I think, but because we'd done national service, um, I actually had some supervisions with him uh, and found him very stimulating. Um, he did, um, as a research student, to some extent, keep himself to himself. Then he was developing um, his uh, doctoral dissertation, his analysis of the beakers, um, uh, which he was doing with a sort of computer seriation. And this was the very early days of computer applications in archaeology, so all of that was sort of seemed rather amazing. Uh, but his great uh, contribution uh, was his book, Analytical Archaeology, um, 
which was um, uh, a really uh, rather uh, breathtakingly good book, uh, because he'd had some good ideas about how archaeology should be systematized, how theories should be made explicit, but then he carried them through in a very systematic way. So that although uh, his contemporary uh, in the United States, Lewis Binford, um, in some ways, I think, had deeper thinking about what he was doing and wrote some articles which were the most influential articles in the new archaeology, um, nobody ever produced a book of the same coherence and breadth uh, as David Clark's analytical archaeology. So that's why the comment on the train, I think, was sustained. It's true uh, that he used a rather special uh, vocabulary there, and this put a lot of people off. Jaquetta Hawkes, who was one of the great humanists of her generation, I think one can say, uh, <laughs> she, uh, uh, she wrote a very scathing review of analytical archaeology and said to read this was like walking on shingle on a beach. Uh, and uh, uh, she was altogether hostile, uh, and Glynn took rather the same view. Um, and it's true that the vocabulary could be regarded as a little pretentious, but um, I think it's a mistake to get too put off by vocabulary, and if one actually took the trouble, I think there was a glossary at the back of the book, but if one took the trouble to become familiar with 20 or so terms, and I used to, when I was teaching, afterwards when I was teaching, I used to have uh, students do uh, classes on uh, unseen comprehension, uh, and then doing their own uh, essays, uh, employing these jargons, it doesn't take very long to become totally at home in the jargon, and I think jargons are often a necessity in any uh, developing study. So that, I think, is all slightly trivial, though it was an obstacle. But I think it was really, uh, it was really one of the great archaeological books of the century. Good. Um, one, I mean, an earlier generation, but the person who, in some ways, almost most inspired Jack Goody was uh, Gordon Child. He often talks about reading his uh, work and how it influenced him. But did, what, what is your view of Gordon Child's contribution? Uh, it's very high indeed. Uh, I think he really was, uh, for me, uh, the most influential archaeologist uh, uh, of our time, though he, he died in 1957 or 58. Um, uh, but when I turned to archaeology seriously in the sense when I'd finished part one natural sciences and so I want to do a, a crash reading course, uh, I read most of the things that a child had, uh, had, had written and he had very clear sense of problem very early on and set out to construct a way of uh, reconstructing the past, piecing together the past as he would uh, call it by using the concept of culture, which had a specific meaning, which he defined very clearly. And uh, then he was interested, of course, in prehistoric migrations, and he traced his way of uh, doing this. Then he wrote about uh, the uh, Indo-European languages. Um, and then uh, he uh, wrote um, uh, two wonderful uh, books, still his best books, uh, really. Uh, what Happened in History it was one of those, where he took the whole business of the origins of civilization uh, in the Near East, and then, as he saw it, the spread, gradual spread of civilization to Europe, and put it all together in uh, a coherent way. He was the person, as you know, who developed the concept of the agricultural revolution and the urban revolution, which, although they're paraphrased in different ways, uh, are central, really, to, uh, uh, to archaeological thinking. Uh, and uh, so I really think he set many of the agendas. Uh, and, of course, uh, like many thinkers, he did have go in different directions at different times. So you would often find, if you have an idea you want to go this way, you can often find uh, uh, lines of support in Child's writing, even though in the main he actually went the other way. I mean, he, in popular, the popular mind, or those who half know about him, they often characterise him as a Marxist. Or well, is, that, is it more a materialist, perhaps? And now, I think you would say, uh, 
it was only, well, not only, but he was a materialist. But since he definitely considered himself to be uh, a Marxist mm. and said so, and since uh, in those days in the 50s, uh, to proclaim that you were a Marxist <laughs> and meant that you were viewed definitely uh, uh, unfavorably in some quarters. Um, he was a Marxist, uh, but he had this complicated um, relationship with Marxism. I think he, he started off as a Marxist in Australia. He was the son of a clergyman and obviously, though I don't know the details, didn't have a happy time at home. Then uh, he was stigmatized as a Marxist uh, in Australia, and this has been quite well documented. Um, and that, I think, was his most uh, active Marxist time. He actually had John Mulvaney's documented how he had secret service reports written on him during the mm. First World War and subsequently uh, in, uh, in uh, Australia. Uh, then he came to uh, Britain and became established, got a job um, in Edinburgh as a professor, uh, and then uh, he became a member of the Athenaeum, and I think he's <laughs> said, I of course didn't know him, but he's said to have enjoyed uh, drinking a tankard of champagne in the Athenaeum while still being a Marxist. <laughs> and, uh, um, then he became very disenchanted when he went to Russia. Hmm. He became quite disenchanted with what was happening. But he remained a Marxist, but if you read uh, the one or two articles in which he sets out his Marxist thought, I find it very difficult, I think most people today would find it difficult to find anything at all to disagree with. And I'm not a Marxist um, uh, in the political sense at all. Um, but I think the child didn't really lay much emphasis on the class struggle, which of course is one part of Marxism that's very much... So he didn't have that sort of agonistic view of Marxism. Um, so I think today I'd agree with you, I would see him as a materialist who called himself a Marxist, so okay, uh, he was, uh, but uh, there are Marxists today with whom one might well disagree, but I don't think Child would be one of them. Excellent. Um, should we just quickly move on, uh, because the tape's coming towards the end, but th let's just get one more phase, and this is um, yes. moving on to do your national service. Right. Was that the next stage after leaving? Yes, um, I, I finished uh, school, of course, and I went to Paris, as yeah. I told you, for two or three months, which I really uh, enjoyed uh, and got to know the Louvre very well. I think uh, I was an, an, an unconsciously laying the foundations for a lot of archaeology, although I spent a lot of time going through the galleries uh, on the, uh, of the left bank. I also went to the Palais de la Découverte and uh, uh, sort of... Uh, indeed, I, I went to some very interesting lectures. I heard Oppenheimer uh, mm -hmm. lecturing, uh, and uh, um, I tried, I've always tried, um, made a point of going to hear people who might be interesting people, even if they were going to be talking uh, above one's head. Um, I did hear a uh, Dirac uh, lecture here mm -hmm. in, in Cambridge. What was he like? Uh, he was very lucid, uh, but um, he was um, essentially... Uh, arguing to his formulae on the blackboard and really f far above my head uh, in what he was doing mathematically. So um, I didn't get a great deal out of that, except it's always, I mean, he, he had a quiet clarity, uh, which certainly uh, came over very well. Uh, Oppenheimer, of course, and this was a public lecture, uh, was much more easy to follow. But I also did something that... Um, uh, uh, in, I uh, went to some seminars uh, in the Sorbonne, which were of course open uh, to uh, on uh, advanced uh, physics, and there was de Broglie, who was uh, uh, a very, the, the prince, the prince de Vogue, um, who wore a, a white uh, uh, wing collar like something out of the 1930s, which indeed he was. Um, and I didn't learn anything from him, but I saw this great figure who was e even earlier than, uh, than Dirac slightly in the history of physics in the 1920s, I suppose. Um, I think I've lost the th <laughs> thread of well, my argument there. We were talking about, uh, yeah. talking about Paris, uh, yeah. that's right. Um, and so I had a great time in, in Paris mm. um, and then uh, went in to do national service. So you did national service before Cambridge. That's right. Uh, I missed that, yes. And um, that, um, uh, I could have deferred it, mm. and had I deferred it, it wouldn't have 
happen because um, it ceased being obligatory. Uh, but I thought it would probably be a good thing to get it over with. And I don't regret doing so because after the first uh, three months, which uh, involved uh, uh, office training, which was mainly on the Isle of Man at Royal Air Force Jerby, and that had its uh, interests. Uh, and then I did some signals uh, training, uh, Royal Air Force Debden, and so did a little bit more physics uh, there. Uh, and then uh, I was stationed uh, at Royal Air Force Wunstorf and uh, was very pleased to be stationed in Germany so that I learnt some German and got to know uh, Germany a little bit and Austria a little bit. And then I also did some teaching. Uh, I did taught um, uh, 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 Airmen, uh, who were also doing their national service mainly, I was able to teach them to do uh, O-level physics, which mm. seemed to be no great problem. And it went very well. The great thing was the class was very successful, and I was one of the nicest things I've done was to have a class of about uh, 15 people all getting good grades in their O-level physics. Um, and so that was an interesting mm. uh, time, had lots of good uh, moments. Mm. Uh, and not went too many bad moments. Well, I suppose quite a lot of rather dreary ones, but uh, uh, no terribly painful ones, I think. I managed to go down to Munich and uh, sort of get slightly drunk in the Hofbräu house, and the same trip I went to uh, Salzburg, and it happened to be the festival, and I managed to walk into uh, a performance, or get a ticket for a performance of the marriage of Figaro with... Uh, Fischer Dieskau oh. and uh, uh, von Karajan conducting Elizabeth Schwarzkopf singing, so <laughs> that was all uh, to the good. And that's when I went, first went to the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna and saw the wonderful Bruegel paintings and lots of other uh, wonderful things. So, uh, no, all that was good fun um, and I enjoyed it uh, and so sort of came back refreshed. To and more mature, and you probably enjoyed Cambridge more because I think so. I think a lot of people tended to just keep on the same trajectory, and it is hard work at school doing those exams, and it is hard work in Cambridge studying for those exams. So mm. I think it was quite constructive to have a break. Yeah, I call it, and they're very fond of it. Fascinating. Just to see if I've got it, the the agricultural revolution occurs. The language changes because of a change in the mode of production in a certain area, and then the language spreads from that area, or does it...? Uh, it, it isn't quite that. If I, if it, it's that um, uh, the farming revolution takes uh, place may, probably at one or two locations that are in contact in the Near East. But anyway, the most westerly region involved uh, is southeast and central Anatolia. So uh, you get farming taking place there, and the point is that the farming uh, technology is inherently an expansive one. It's expansive for demographic reasons uh, that uh, a typical uh, hunter-gatherer population density in such an area, uh, not necessarily a maritime area, which is more complicated, is perhaps uh, one person per ten square kilometres. Uh, whereas uh, uh, a straightforward farming economy in such an area, a dry farming economy, will easily support a population of 10 persons per square kilometre. That's a change of a factor of 100. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, that is uh, the reason that um, uh, I think farming economies often, not always, but often, are very expansive uh, economies. And there's no doubt that farming did spread um, uh, across Europe, uh, Cavalli, Sforza and Ammerman formalised the uh, demographic ideas, called it a wave of advance. Uh, and though that may be a slight oversimplification, I think their ideas are interesting and the emphasis on the demography is sound. So what that means uh, is that um, whatever the language was of the, uh, uh, the economy that was now spreading, because it had become a farming economy, uh, was spread across Europe. And therefore, that's the only reason that leads me to situate Proto-Indo-European in central Anatolia, because if you trace that, uh, uh, if you go back through time to where that movement uh, essentially originated, um, it must have been central Anatolia.